If you have your Bible with you this morning, I'd like for you to turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. It's been interesting for me. We've been dealing with um, books of the Bible on Wednesday nights for a couple of years now and, and teaching uh, books of the Bible and we're dealing with the book of Galatians right now, and it's been fun, it's exciting. We just finished the book of Romans, and, and when, you, when you deal with an entire book of the Bible, it's, it's amazing what happens. We previously did the book of Acts, and, and um, you know, um, Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, is probably the only writer in the New Testament who wrote more than the Apostle Paul, but the... Uh, uh, Luke, who wrote the book of Luke and who wrote Acts, probably wrote more words that's in the New Testament than the Apostle Paul, but, but the Apostle Paul uh, wrote several books. It's estimated 13 or 14 of the 27 books that's in the Bible, uh, even though some of them were short to the churches, they were written by the Apostle Paul. And it's amazing that the Apostle Paul was not one of the 12. Uh, he was not uh, one of the disciples. He was you know, somebody who who uh, was actually, when Jesus was on the earth, he was he was very abusive to Christians. He was somebody who was out to kill and to destroy Christians. And so the the uh, Apostle Paul was was someone who was was uh, um, just you know a different sort of person, I guess we should say. But he he was he was not one of the twelve. But he had an encounter with Jesus Christ on the Damascus Road where his life was forever changed. And, and it was an encounter where Jesus himself showed him and came to him and uh, told him he wanted to use him. But just like if you study the life of uh, Peter uh, and, and Paul, these guys were not necessarily what you call good church boys. You all know what I mean when I say good church boys. You know... Um, I was raised in church. First place I ever went as a baby was church. When I was two weeks old, that was the first place I went. I grew up in church, was in church my whole life. Yet at the same time, uh, I recognized that going to church and being in church all your life doesn't necessarily mean everything goes the way you want it to go as a child of God. Everybody understand that? I'm going to read a passage here and... It's obvious to me, and I'm going to read something to you that many of you have heard. I've read it before from the pulpit. But, but how many of you understand <clears throat> God uses broken people to do big things? And, you know, one of the things that I... That I deal with in talking to people is people having the attitude or the belief that God can't use them to do something he wants to do. They think they aren't good enough. I, it's amazing to me how many people you talk about coming to church, you invite them to church, and they think they got to straighten out something in their life before they start coming to church. You know, I'd almost like to get on TV and make an announcement to everybody that don't go to church is... Ain't nobody at my church perfect. Not one amen. Did you get that? <laughs> Ain't nobody at the church I pastor perfect. Amen. Okay, all right. That's what I was looking for. Man, I was about to think you all thought you was a bunch of perfect people. God sometimes doesn't use the ideal candidate. Here in 2 Corinthians chapter 10... Beginning at verse 7, the Apostle Paul is trying to prove... You know, everywhere he went, they wanted to know, who, who do you think you are? You've got to understand, he was not one of the disciples. And, and, and when he got saved and he started doing things for the Lord, they kept asking him, where's your credentials? And we, with this past Wednesday night, we got to talking about this in class. And, and you know, 
he, he was a nobody, came from nowhere, had this encounter with Christ, and the guys, the boys in Jerusalem, where the, the, the main church was, where the apostles were, they didn't even believe that this guy had an encounter with Christ. But he did. And we're looking back at it, and we see all these things, but it's amazing what this guy, how many times he had to try to prove himself. Listen carefully to this. Paul is speaking, verse 7. Do you look at things according to the outward appearance? If anyone is convinced in himself that he is Christ's, let him again consider this in himself, that just as he is Christ, even so we are Christ. Paul's saying, you know, you guys don't even think I'm saved. You don't even think I got anything. But if you think you are, realize I'm Christ too. For even if I should boast somewhat more about our authority, which the Lord gave us for edification and not for your destruction, I shall not be ashamed, lest I seem to terrify you by letters. For his letters, they say, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. Let such a person consider this, that what we are in word by letters, when we are absent, such we will also be indeed when we are present. For we dare not classify ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves, but they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wives we have a real tendency in today world in today's world to look at people god uses or doesn't use and we make a judgment of them of what we see what we hear how they behave what's on the outside what it looks like from the outside instead of really understanding what's in the heart and you know god can use anybody he wants to use to do big things we don't choose the candidate that God chooses. And today, what I, what I really want to try to do is, is I, I want you to, to understand that God may choose you to do something that you don't feel qualified to do. I really believe at the moment that God is looking and searching out and he's asking me to do some things and I believe he's wanting us as a corporate body to do some things that I don't really necessarily feel very qualified to do. But how many of you know if God calls you to do something, you can do it? Do you understand that? If he asks you to do something, he knows how qualified you are or you aren't. And you can do whatever it is he's putting it on your heart to do. Again, I want to read this to you. You've heard it before, but just think about this for a moment. God didn't sometimes you choose the ideal candidate. Noah was a drunk. Abraham was too old. Isaac was a daydreamer. Jacob was a liar. Leah wasn't very good looking. Joseph was abused. Moses had a stuttering problem. Gideon was afraid. Samson had long hair. You all know. Couldn't use a man with long hair. Rahab was a prostitute. Jeremiah and Timothy were too young. David had an affair and was a murderer. Elijah was suicidal. Think about that. Prophet of God. Suicidal. Isaiah preached naked. Y'all have nothing to worry about. <laughs> Jonah ran from God. Naomi was a widow. Job 
went through bankruptcy. Peter denied Christ. The disciples fell asleep while praying. The Samaritan woman was divorced more than once. Zacchaeus was too short. And get this last one. Lazarus was dead. Now, the question, can God use broken people to do what he wants to do? Do you understand God can use anybody, anywhere, to do what he wants done? We've got to participate. But what happens with so many of us is because of how we think, because of how we feel, because of the conflicts that we're going through, we feel that we've been disqualified for God to use us to do certain things He wants to do. We just think, I don't, I'm not qualified. I don't, I don't have what it takes. I can't do God may not have disqualified you. Now, it's obvious to me that the Apostle Paul was a very gifted man. God chose the Apostle Paul to take this gospel to the Gentiles. Paul wasn't called to the Jews. He was called to the Gentiles, even though he was one of the chief Jews. And, and, and uh, he was called to the Gentiles. And, and he was a very gifted man. He uh, was a Roman citizen which gave him certain rights and privileges and certain authority in certain places because of, of where he had studied and what he had done and all of the positions that he had. And, and, and this guy, the Apostle Paul, because he went to the Gentiles, it's amazing how many churches he went and established. You've got to understand, he, uh, Jesus said, I will build my church. And he used a guy that wasn't one of the twelve, who wasn't with him. He used somebody that was a nobody in what we would call Christian circles at that time to establish a variety of churches. He, he, I mean, just to name a few, you know, Ephesus, he started it. Uh, uh, he started a church at Rome. He started a church at Colossae. He started a church at Galatia. The Apostle Paul started and founded many churches uh, that we read about here in the Bible. And, and uh, uh, you know, First and Second Corinthians, he, he uh, established a church at Corinth. And here in this passage of Scripture in Second Corinthians, Paul is having to defend himself and to defend his credentials in order to do what God had called him to do. Paul's asking or answering the question, do you have what it takes to do what God wants you to do? In wrestling with the title for today, I, 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 I'm, I'm just not a title sermon preacher, but that's, that's one of the questions I'm asking. Do you have what it takes for God to use you? So we begin to ask, well, what does it take? What qualifications do you have to meet for God to use you? I only really know of one. You've got to be willing to let him. Well, I don't live good enough. Well, you don't know how anybody else lives. You judge what's on the outside of people. You judge what you see. We judge things from this outward thing. But do you have what it takes. And the Apostle Paul is dealing with people who believe he's unqualified, he's not capable, he doesn't have what it takes to do what God has called him to do. Listen to me. Whatever it is that God's called you to do is too important for you to leave the main ingredient, the main issue, unconfronted. You're going to have to confront this issue today of what did I take, what, what's the qualification? 
Are you willing to let God use you where you are, how you are, the way you are, when he wants to, right this moment? Can he do it? Look at somebody and say, you ought to let him use you. Well, I'm just afraid people won't believe it was God if he uses me. Well, what you don't understand is, most of us know, <laughs> you couldn't do it if it wasn't God. It amazes me. It amazes me. How if you're willing, God can use you to do things but so many people in the church judge by appearances. How many of you know that? Huh? It's a big problem in our world today. We look at people, and because of how they look or how they act or how they conduct themselves, we develop an opinion, God can't use them. And we judge people by their appearance. How many of y'all know there's more to me than what you see? Do y'all know that? Steve Cook, stand up. <laughs> there is far more to this guy than you can see by just looking at him. I'm serious. I could go around this room. It's amazing. Wayne, I'm looking you dead in the eye right now. <laughs> There's more to us than we realize. Now, what would happen, what would happen if we would look below the surface of some people and see some of the stuff that God sees. How many of you know that in your spirit, in your heart of hearts, inside of you, you have conversations with God and you talk to God and you communicate with God in ways that you just don't know how you can express to anybody. You say things, you have these intimate times with God where you just express things in your heart. How many of you know that? And, and, and you know that nobody but God really knows what's in there. And, and, and so, you, you know, most of us, wildly overestimate what we can do without God but underestimate what we can do with God. We wildly overestimate what we can do without God. We just start looking at how we can do it and do, depending on this and we get it together and we think we got it all figured out. But then we, we look, we underestimate what we can do with God. What could God do with you? Hmm? What could he do with you? Frank, come here a minute. I have in my hand some money. See that? It's money. What is that first bill? A dollar. A one dollar bill. 
I would like for you to give me an estimate, and if you get the estimate right of how much money I have here, I'll give it to you. You want to hold it? Now, you can't flip in it, but just hold it and look at it and see. Tell me, how much money do you think I have there? About $40. Okay. What, what do you think now? I'm out of the ballpark. Okay. <laughs> so I get to keep it, right? right? Thank you very much. I'm so glad. <laughs> I was looking around because I didn't want somebody prophetic. But my point is, what you see on the outside, the thickness and the size, huh? see, if he would have looked really close at these edges, he would have known that there were other bills in there that was worth more than what you could see. The Lord's calling somebody to tell you something to do. <laughs> Now, just think with me a moment. I'm trying to use, you know, an illustration to make a statement to you that says there's more in the stack than you can see on the surface. How many of you understand that? Huh? Frank? There would have been another hundred dollars there, but I didn't have a hundred dollar bill. But I had a one dollar bill, a two dollar bill, a five dollar bill, a ten dollar bill, a twenty dollar bill, and I had to dig in my wallet, but I did find a fifty, no hundreds. But my point is. There's more to you than we can see on the outside. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? I want you to catch this. I want you to see what I'm trying to say this morning. What we see on the outside is not indicative of what's going on inside people. I sit with so many people and I communicate with so many people and I talk with so many people who have a desire on the inside of them to do things for God, who wants to be obedient to God, who wants to be used of God and, 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 and God to work with them and to work through them, yet at the same time, they always are talking about something they see or do in their behavior or the way they think or something in their background or something that has happened in their life that disqualifies them for being able to be used of God. Can I just tell you all this? I personally don't believe that there are any second-class citizens in the family of God. Pastor, why do you believe that? Because I believe that the very same blood of Jesus Christ that cleansed me from sin and washed away my sins and gives me freedom every day I live that everybody who has been born into the family of God and come into the family of God that the same blood that cleansed me from all unrighteousness has cleansed you from all unrighteousness and therefore if Jesus saved me with all my faults, all my flaws, all my shortcomings, I believe that he saved you too. I do. But some of us don't think that way. We don't believe that way. We think that Jesus likes and does more for other people than he likes and does for us. You know... It, again, it took the same blood 
the same beating, the same Savior to get me into the family of God that it takes to get you in. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Can you say amen to that? So, I'm confident today, and I believe that I belong in the family of God. I belong there. Do you know why? Because Jesus paid the price for me and you to be in the family. Look at somebody and say, I belong. Will you say, I belong? See, true confidence is about belonging. Belonging. You know, it's amazing to me. Your children have no problem interrupting you, walking in on you, coming into your house, and taking what they want, getting what they want, because they know they belong to you. Is that right? I go to my dad's. I walk in the house. I look at my sister and I'll say, you got any of this? Can I have this? She goes, it's yours, don't you? He tells you all the time everything is here. I said, yeah, but I don't want to get something that's yours. She said, he, if it's mine and it's his, it's yours. You belong here. You all understand that? You all understand how important belonging is? So I just want to ask you the question today. What qualifies you to belong in the family of God? What qualifies you to belong to the Lord Jesus Christ? What qualifies you to be called a child of God? Talk to me. Come on, tell me. What, what qualifies you to be a child of God? The blood of Jesus. I'm hard to hear and say it louder. You received his gift. So you belong to him. Y'all belong to him? How, how many of y'all in this section right here belong to God? How many in this section belong to him? How many over here? Over here, you belong to God? Do y'all belong to God in this section? Okay. Do you, y'all back here? You belong to God? So, we belong to God. What qualifies us to belong to Him? The blood of Jesus. The resurrection power that worked in Christ brought Him back from the dead. When we accepted Christ, the blood that covered our sins, when God did that and we received what Jesus did, we have the right to belong. <clears throat> Do you realize that as part of the family of God, that God looks at, to those of us who belong to Him, those of us who belong to Him, and He says to us, you have the right to come to the very throne of God and boldly ask for anything that you need in your life. Is that right? Why don't we do it? We think we're not qualified. We think we shouldn't do that. We think we probably don't have the right to ask God. We start looking at the conflicts that we have. You know, if I hadn't have done what I did the other day, if I hadn't have said what I said, if I hadn't have been thinking what I'd have been thinking, I would have the right to pray or ask God. I, I, hmm? How many of you know that's how we think?
We let the conflict that we're dealing with hinder our confidence to ask God. Guys, I'm, I'm trying to talk to us in a way that... Am I the only one who deals with this? Huh? Because we are dealing with something or we're struggling with something, you know, you're mad at your mate or your kids and you don't think you can pray. Yeah, that's where we are. We, 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 we struggle with something. And, and I really think that the church in general, has missed it to a degree because too many people feel like that they should become something in order to belong to God. we got to become something in order to belong. No, if you understood that you belonged to God, you then would have a confidence inside of you to realize that because I know I belong to Him, I can become everything that I have been predestined to become. You don't become in order to belong, you belong in order to become. Because I belong to God... I'm made in His image, I'm made in His likeness, I have accepted Him, I have His Spirit living inside of me, His Spirit inside of me is now directing my life, He's in control of my life, every day I live I want to communicate with Him in a way that will help me, and because I belong to Him, I know that He can use me anywhere, anytime, any place to do anything He wants done. You all understand that? What if he wants to use you to heal somebody today, but you won't pray for him? You won't command it. What if he wants to use you to bless somebody, but you won't be willing to do? What if he wants to use you to show somebody forgiveness? They know they did you wrong. They know they said something. They know they acted in a way that was inappropriate and they're struggling with it and you're just happy that they're still struggling. Let them suffer a while. When maybe what God wants you to do is say, hey, it's over, don't worry about it, forgive me. Be free. Why would anybody want to hold a charge against somebody else when Christ has set us free from every sin there is? Why do I know he does it? Because I belong to him. I know him. He's mine. I'm his. I belong to him. Listen to me. The gospel is not become to belong. The good news is you belong to him in order to become what he wants you to become. I don't have to become in order to belong. Because I belong, I can become what he wants me to become. Do you know I belong right where I'm at this morning because of Jesus? Do you all realize if I started comparing myself with preachers across the country and with pastors across the country, I could very quickly come to a place where I look at my life and I say, I'm not qualified to do this. I'm not qualified to be in charge of this. I'm not qualified to be responsible for this. I'm not qualified to pray for the sick. I'm not qualified to, to do what God, to teach His Word. I'm not qualified. I could go through all of the things and find, if I look at me and somebody else, I could say, I'm not qualified. I look around, I see great men of God who have great characteristics. There's great things that they can do. But I, I can disqualify myself if I start comparing myself with everybody else. But do you know what we're qualified to do? Whatever God asks us to do. So today, I'm talking to a group of very qualified people who are capable of doing Everything God wants us to do because we belong to Him. Look at somebody and tell them, I belong to Him.
because of Jesus, I have access to God. It amazes me how many people are trying to disqualify people from having access to God. We want to judge people. We want to look at the outside. We want to look at what's on the outside of somebody. We see, we see, we see something on the outside, and all we can see is that's not worth very much. That's very little value. That's not worth anything. We don't know what's on the inside, and because we only see somebody that we think is very little value, we don't really know what's on the inside. It's amazing when you get to know people what's on the inside of them. Do you know there's some very qualified people who struggle with addiction? Do you know there is some very qualified people who struggle with alcoholism? Do you know there are some very qualified people who judge with another sin called judgmentalism? Did you all know that when God looks on the inside that He thinks that judgmentalism is just as terrible as addiction. But you think that's a bigger bill. It's worth more. God doesn't. God knows who belongs to Him because He doesn't see it from the outside. He sees it from the inside. See, I'm a boy who grew up in church. I grew up in church, and I would look at these people and these ladies and these men who would act a certain way at church and dress a certain way at church, and I thought, boy, look at them. They got to be right with God because they look like they're right with God. They, 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 I see them at church, and then you'd see them on the outside, and you wasn't sure. Y'all, any of y'all ever deal with that? You know, I was giving my testimony a little bit the other night in our class, and, and I can remember, you know, I told my dad the night I accepted him as my Savior, I said, Dad, I just want you to understand, I'm a Christian, but I'm not Church of God. I'm sorry I said that, Dad, if you're listening to my tape. <clears throat> but that's how I felt at the moment. Why? Because what I had seen from some of those people in their judgmentalism, I didn't want that to be in my life. But see, we have a tendency to look at how other people see themselves and how they see Christ, and instead of seeing each other the way Christ sees us and to see what He has done in them and look for Jesus in Do you know if you would look for Jesus in people, you may find Jesus when it doesn't look like they're qualified for Him to live there. He lives in some what we might call very unqualified people's lives because He moves into the spirit, into the heart. Their minds aren't renewed. Their bodies don't look the way we would think. But, but, but he moves in and, 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 and lives there. Guys, I'm just really trying to say today, it amazes me how many people are looking for ways to put people out of the family of God and out of belonging to God instead of people who are trying to draw them in to belong to God. Look at somebody and tell them you belong in the family of God. Would you just tell them that? Now, the Apostle Paul had to defend himself all the time. And I, and I really want you to get this, because I, I really got this last, last Wednesday night. We're sitting in class, and I realized God decided he was going to use the Apostle Paul, to do something for him. And he wasn't Presbyterian, Baptist, Pentecostal. He, he didn't belong to any of the denominations. Did you notice? I have multiple denominations of bills here. God's on every one of them because it says in God we trust on every one of them. Now, catch what I'm saying. I want you to catch this.
Paul was a rebel rouser. He was an accuser. He attacked people who were Christians. He didn't belong to any of the groups that were following Jesus. And if you were a follower of Jesus, Paul was out to kill you and to destroy you. And he had been doing that. And Jesus comes along and says, Hey, Paul, I want to use you. It's amazing to me he didn't have to go down to the first Jerusalem church and get Peter, James, John, and all the rest of the apostles and say, I, I hope it's all right with you guys, but I'm going to use this guy named Saul of Tarsus. You know, he didn't do that. God just decided he was going to use this guy and chose him and went and had a road with him and says, hey, I want you to follow me. It was so powerful, he was blind. And God had to speak to a guy named Ananias to go and pray for him to get... To, I mean, he had this encounter. It was just, it knocked him off his feet. But he come down and he said, you belong to me. Well, nobody accepts it. Nobody. Do you realize it was 20 years before the Jerusalem boys accepted Paul? You read through the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 9, it says that they were having this big uproar in town because Paul was in this town preaching the gospel and everybody in there got mad. And it says that they finally convinced Paul to leave and Paul left and it says there was peace in the city. Peace because Paul left. But let me ask you, did he belong to God as much as anybody else belonged to God? Belonging. Paul. Paul himself wrestled with what the people were saying. He was trying to get across his point that God called me. Here's a guy who wrote, and, and, and think about this. Now, you, you know, I could, I could talk about this a long time. They, they started talking. I just read this to you. I'm going to read it to you in the Message Bible here in a moment. But I read it to you in the New King James because they were saying, you know, that Paul... He can write, but he can't talk. He can say big, bold things. He comes across really straight in his letters. He writes these letters that are bold, and he writes these letters there. But when he comes and shows up, what they were saying is Paul can write, but he can't preach a lick. Do you know who one of the greatest preachers of Paul's day was? A fellow by the name of Apollos. Apollos. One of the greatest orators of that time. Apollos was one of the, they're, they're, he was one of the guys, they'd say, I'm of Paul, and they'd say, I'm of Apollos, because Apollos was one of those guys who could preach, who could teach, who could, who could talk, he could communicate. But isn't it amazing here, over 2,000 years later, ain't a one of us quoting Apollos in any great sermon he preached. Not a one of us are saying, well, Apollos said, but we stand up all the time and quote Paul. Right? But Paul struggled with this thing. Let me tell you something. The very thing that you think you're weak in, and the very thing that people say you're weak in, God may use it as a strength. See, they were all saying, this Paul, he can't talk, he can't pre preach, he can't, he can't be bold when he's there, and Paul is trying to defend himself. You read it right in there, he's trying to say, well, I, this is what I'm doing. He's, he, it's what he was doing. Let me read this to you from the... Message Bible. He says here in verse 7, You stare and stare at the obvious, but you can't see the forest for the trees. If you're looking for a clear example of someone on Christ's side, why do you so quickly cut me out? Believe me, I am quite sure of my standing with Christ. I am quite sure of my standing with Christ. You may think I overstate the authority he gave me, but I'm not backing off. Every bit of my commitment is for the purpose of building you up after all, not tearing you down. He said, I'm trying to build you up. and You guys, you won't even receive it. And what's this talk about me bullying you with my letters? His letters are brawny and potent, but in person he's a weakling and mumbles when he talks. Such talk won't survive scrutiny. What we write when we when, went away, we do when present. We're the exact same people, present, absent or present, in letter and in person. We're not, understand, 
putting ourselves on a league with those who boast like they're superior, we wouldn't dare do that. But we are, we in all these quite, in, in all these comparing and grading and competing, they quite miss the point. What's the point? The point is, Paul is someone God called and said, I'm going to use you. It didn't matter what anybody else thought. What would happen if every one of us here started to realize we belong to God and we're qualified to do anything God has called us to do? They were saying, Paul, if you'd preach better, we could take you better. But all you can do is write those harsh, stern words. This guy wrote 13 or 14 of the 27 books of the New Testament. He wrote somewhere between 23 to 28% of the entire New Testament. The Apostle Paul was very powerful very mighty some people take the four gospels because jesus hadn't been dead and buried and his numbers jump way up if you take matthew mark luke and john out of the new covenant books after you understand after the death burial and resurrection of jesus but here's somebody god called and he qualified and he said you belong to me i'm looking at a group of people today that you are called you are qualified and you belong to me. God can use you. Whether anybody else says he can use you or not. Quit listening to everybody else. And listen to God. Let's stand. Thank you. Apostle Paul is the man who said, when I am weak, then I'm strong. He wasn't dependent on himself. He was dependent on God to use him. Lord, you see everyone here this morning, and you know everyone's makeup. You know what's on the inside of each and every one that's here, Lord Jesus. So, Lord... Help us to feel that sense of belonging to you today. Help us to understand that it was what Jesus did that brings us into the family. And that our faith in him is what causes us to be more than conquerors. Help us to get our eyes off of ourselves and our conflicts and our shortcomings and get our eyes on you. And say, Lord, I ask you to use us for your glory for your honor, for your praise. Use us, Lord, I pray. We give you honor and praise right now, Lord Jesus. With every head bowed for just a moment and every eye closed, if you're here today and you know that God may be speaking to you, that God may be from time to time asking you to do things and this message has spoken to you in some way. I just, I just want to kind of know that maybe I've been talking to you. Would you just slip your hand up anywhere? I'm not asking. I'm just saying, okay, yes, okay, yes, great. Thank you, Lord. What I want to do right this moment is I want to pray. you to understand it's God who qualified you you don't qualify yourself he qualified you therefore if he calls you and he asks you to do something you can do it you can do whatever it is so father I pray for every hand that was raised every person that acknowledged today Lord that you are speaking to them 
Lord, it's not a thundering, roaring voice from heaven that talks to them, but you speak into their hearts and into their spirits over and over again, drawing them into a place to be used of you. So God, today I'm asking you to give us boldness to come boldly to your throne and ask you what we need. Minister your life to us, Lord Jesus, I pray today. Touch us in special ways, we pray. In Jesus' name.